Okay, so last time that we left off with class, we had left off with this derivation. So I want to remind you real quickly about what we did here because we need to talk about some sign conventions. So we need to remember exactly what we talked about. So remember when we went to do this, we wanted to find what the energy transitions were, the difference between one energy level and the next energy level. And so to do that, we did the same thing that we do for a change in anything. We took our final and we subtracted our initial. Now we don't have actual values for these though, but we do have these equations. We have this equation that says, well, the Rydberg's constant times by one or Z, depending on if it's not hydrogen, over whatever energy level you're talking about is equal to the energy level. So we can do this for a really generic case and go ahead and write this out for each one, for the initial energy level and the final energy level. We can fill those in, we can get this equation, and then with a little bit of algebra, we end up with one of these two. And that's where we had left off last time. And remember I said, well, you know, this comes up in both directions. You'll see this written both ways. The only difference is in one case, the negative sign is pulled out. In the other case, it's distributed in. So now we need to talk about some sign errors because people tend to mess this up a lot. And it's one of the main reasons people get, we'll, we'll start calling Rydberg problems wrong. These energy level transition problems wrong. Now, if you have the lowest energy level, so n equals one, that's gonna be your most negative. So, you know, look back on that equation, look at what it looks like. That's gonna be your most negative, which means that's your lowest, which makes sense. N equals one should be your lowest energy. So now let's think about what happens if we have the two different types of transitions, if we're going up in energy or if we're going down in energy. So first, let's look if we're going from low to high. So something of this sort. If we're going from a low to a high energy, then our final is gonna be higher than our initial. So that's gonna make it positive because our final is high, our initial is low. So final minus initial, a high minus a low number is gonna be positive. So that's how you can remember it. Keywords to look at for this are things like photon absorbed. That'll cue you off to the fact that the delta E is negative. Now, let's look at the reverse. What if you're going down in energy? You're going from an n equals five to an n equals two level. If you see something like that, you'll see words such as photon emitted. And that means that you're losing your photon, is, or excuse me, your electron is losing energy. It's going down. And so if that's the case, now your final energy is lower than your initial energy. <coughs> so final minus initial is gonna be a small number minus a low number, which means that it's gonna be negative. Small number minus high number is a negative number. And so delta E in that case is going to be negative. So when I talk about delta E, that can be either positive or negative depending on the situation. Now, think about this equation that we've used throughout the quarter. E equals H nu for H in frequency or HC over lambda. Can that ever be negative? Well, frequency can't be negative and lambda can't be negative. So this E can never be negative. So the energy of a photon is always gonna be positive. The delta E, you have to decide whether it's gonna be positive or negative based on whether you're absorbing a photon or emitting a photon. And this is gonna come into play when we do the Rydberg problems. It's also the reason why I tend to prefer doing them the way that me and your book does it as opposed to the way that your homework gives you hints on how to do it. So with that, we're gonna go and do a couple examples. So for our first one, I say that a photon is emitted when hydrogen, so we know that our Z is equal to one, undergoes a transition from the N equals two levels. And I also tell you that the photon that's going to be emitted has this frequency. And I want you to find the initial energy level. So there's gonna be a few different things that we need here. First of all, we have frequency and we're looking for an energy. So we're gonna probably need E equals H nu. We also have a transition happening. So we're going to need the Rydberg formula. So we'll write that down. And now we need to figure out how we are gonna fill this in. So we need to know the initial energy level. We're looking for this 
given that we know our final energy level, it's hydrogen, so. Yeah. All right, so we have our E equals H nu. We have our delta E equals negative RH Z squared, one over NF, one over NI. So we have each one. Now we know that we're looking for NI, but we don't have delta E. All we have is the energy of the, fo or the frequency of the photon. But we can find delta e, or e because we know that whatever the energy of the emitted photon is, is gonna be the magnitude of this energy. We don't know about the sign that we're gonna have to make the decision for. So we'll start here. E equals h nu. So we fill in Planck's constant. And we solve for that. We should always pay attention to sig figs, so I'm just going to put a little line there to show that that's our last significant figure. Now that we have this, we can just fill it into here. But we have to make a choice and say, well, we know that this always has to be positive. That's not always true of delta E. So is delta E going to be positive or negative? Well, since a photon is emitted, that means we're going down in energy levels. Our electron is going from a high energy level to a lower energy level. And that means that it's going to have to be negative. So when we fill this value in, we have to change the sign. And that is a, one of the main reasons that people get this, these types of questions wrong on exams. So from here we can fill everything in. We know that our final energy level is two. Don't forget to square it. And that's our Ni. So at this point it just becomes a massive algebra problem. And I'll let you sit and work through all the details of the algebra at home. Something to make sure you do quite a bit of practice on. And you get Ni equals four. So that means it went from the N equals four state down to the N equals two state. If this had come out to be 3.98, we'd round that to four. We, anything, when we're talking about energy levels, it has to be an integer, right? You can't be in between energy levels. You have to be at this energy level or this energy level, not in between. So if you're close to one, 3.1 would round to three, you know, 3.9 would round to four, just round. Now, if you're not close, if you're at 3.4 or 3.6, don't round that. That means you screwed up. Go back and figure out where you messed up. Most likely in the case of a photon emitted, it's actually right here. It's forgetting to say that that delta E is negative. Um, and that happens a lot if you use the formula version of this that has one over lambda in it. So that's why I choose to have you guys do it this way, but you can do it whichever way you want. Just make sure that this is an actual integer. And if not, you messed up. On an exam, it's worth some partial credit if you go through and you say, hey, I know that this is supposed to be an integer, but I can't figure out how to get it to be an integer. So make sure you write those down too. Okay, one more example. Now I say, what is the photon, or what is the wavelength of a photon emitted during a transition from the n equals five to n equals two state in a hydrogen atom? So we're gonna do the same sort of situation. So we fill in delta E, and we fill in our Rydberg equation. So now, at this point, we can sort of just fill in all our values and work backwards to get wavelengths. Mm. 
making sure to square everything, making sure that you remember that there's a Z in here. This is another place where everybody does it a little bit differently, depending on if you're looking at your book or your homework or random internet sites. Sometimes what you'll see is that Z is included either here or here and here, it doesn't matter which. And other times what you'll see, and this especially comes on if you start Googling around on the internet, is that people will include Z in the Rydberg um, for it, constant. And you'll see tables of Rydberg constants for different ions, um, different hydrogen-like ions. So we're gonna just generalize it to say that, well, in general, you can take and you can multiply Z squared by the Rydberg constant for hydrogen and get the right answer and use this form. But you should be aware that there's lots of different ways to do this so that if you see it on the internet, it, it doesn't bother you. Or if you see this equation written without Z, it's not that it's wrong, it's just that they're assuming that you're gonna use the Rydberg constant for whichever atom you're talking about. But we're gonna keep using it this way. So when you fill this in, you get that. Notice it's negative. That makes sense. We're going from a high energy level to a low energy level. It should be negative. But at this point, we need to solve for wavelength. So you should be thinking, well, that means I'm going to have to use this equation. And we'll rearrange it for lambda. Now the question becomes, what do I fill in for E? We'll fill in the rest real quick. So when we go to fill in for E, we don't want to fill in the negative value, right? Because we're solving for lambda. And wavelength can't be negative. It's a distance. And so that's always going to be positive. So what we fill in for energy here is need to be positive too. Because this energy is delta energy. This is the energy of a photon. And sometimes it's useful to go ahead and just write energy of a photon there especially when we get in a little bit later in the chapter and we start having the difference between total energy and energy of one photon. So at this point, we just solve this problem, keeping track of our sig figs all along. And so we get this. Now, oftentimes, if you're around this region of the um, electromagnetic spectrum, you'll I see that they ask for it in nanometers. And so we'll go ahead and write that out in nanometers. The only reason for that is, again, this is sitting around the visible range. And so sometimes it's nice if you get used to putting things in nanometers when you're in that region, because people get, they, they know kind of where the colors are there. So a lot of times that'll be asked for in nanometers. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little bit of talking about lasers and how they work. So the basic idea of a laser, I'll turn on the lights a little bit more for this, is that you have a sort of tube-like structure and you have gas in the tube. And then you have something like electricity, usually from a battery, that's gonna take and make the gas um, be giving off light in, in the same way that we've been talking about here, that they were emitting light in order, by, in order to um, you, you promote up the electrons, the electrons fall back down, and they emit light. Now, what this actually stands for is light amplification by stimulated emission. So what that means is that you're forcing it to emit radiation, you're forcing it to emit light, and then you're amplifying it. And the way that the amplification works is by having it bounce back and forth, and then you let off a certain amount and all of it is of the exact same wavelength or very close to the exact same wavelength. So here I have a little picture of it that shows you this, where you take and you put in some energy, you push it up, and then it falls back down. And when it falls back down, it lets off light energy. So when you go to do this, this is how you get your little laser pointer. And this is how we get all the lasers that we, we go through. 
Now, there's something a little interesting to talk about lasers, too, before we do some problems. Um, most of the problems that we're going to do surrounding this are talking about how the photon of one, one photon in this is going to relate to the total energy packet, or the total amount of energy in one little pulse of the laser. So let's think about this a little bit and how this works. So once again, it's bouncing back and forth. The mirror reflects back most of it, which amplifies the light. And then some of it passes through the mirror. It's only partially mirrored. And then that's what gives you your light. So this is all coherent. It all goes on one, one pathway. So now let's think about something here that happens with laser light, but not anything else. When I put the laser up like this, you can't see anything going in between there, right? You can't see that line that must be going from this laser pointer to there. You just see when it hits the wall. So of course, this is why they make great cat toys, right? And they don't ever know where they're coming from. So the question is, why can't we see that? If I shine this light, that same thing doesn't happen. So how does the laser light work? And is there a way that we can make it so that we can see the laser? Well, it's not as if the light's magically appearing on the other side. We can make it so that we can see the laser. So here we have a bit of liquid nitrogen. So use liquid nitrogen off and on for demos. So the way that this works is it's just very, very cold. So liquid nitrogen has, has a very low boiling point. It boils at, a, at room temperature. So when I just have it sitting out like this, it's actually just boiling. And that's what you um, can kind of see as it evaporates away. So when I go like this then, you can see some, some steam or some vapor. So that's not the liquid nitrogen you're seeing, right? That's not the nitrogen evaporating away that you're seeing. That's because it's so cold that it's taking water in the air and condensing it. So we have little water droplets. So now if I shine the laser pointer and I pour the liquid nitrogen over it, you can see the laser beam. So this is how, you know, in spy movies, they have the sort of thing that they spray on it. Well, I'm not sure that's liquid nitrogen, but it's the same principle. And you can see the laser beam. So we know that the laser beam has to actually be passing through something. So how in that case does it actually work? Well, we need to think about what the laser is and what, how our eyes actually work in order to see this. So how does our eye see anything? When I point this laser pointer up here, for instance, how do we see that up on the, the screen? Well, if we have this up on the screen, that means that what's really happening is the light's bouncing off the screen and it's bouncing into your eyes. The way your eyes see something is for photons of light to hit the back of it. So when I point the laser pointer at the screen or the wall or wherever, it never scatters. It, because of the way that the, the laser works, it never scatters into your eyes, and so you never get to see it. As soon as it hits something, like this wall, now it scatters into your eyes, and now you can see it. When I take the liquid nitrogen and I pour it over the light, now what's happening is those water vapors, those water droplets are condensing. We're making kind of a miniature cloud type idea, right? And so the laser light's bouncing off the water particles into your eyes, and that's what you're seeing. So that's how um, the, the way that the lasers work for that. Now, how we're going to use and calculate and work with lasers for the most part here is by doing problems like this, because this is where it comes into play with what we've been doing. So here we have a monochromatic beam of light, and I tell you how many joules are in that, in that um, packet. So when it, we say like packets of light or beam of light, what we kind of mean is if I take this and just pulse it for a minute, how much, what's the total energy in that button of light or that packet of light? And so these can be really tiny. I mean, a laser can pulse at little femtoseconds or picoseconds, or you know, in the case of me, because my, I can only go so fast, milliseconds, things like that. So we'll do this problem.
So here we have, a, once again, the question just written out. So to do this, we need to think about what we can solve for and what we sort of know from real life. It's not really going to be a formula. We're just kind of going to figure it out. So if we know how many moles we have and we know our total energy, how can we relate those two together? And I ask you what the wavelength is. Now, if we want to find wavelengths, we really only have one way to do that, right? We need E equals HC over lambda. So to get this, we need to have that energy. So the question becomes, do you just fill in 2.5 joules? Well, no. This is where it's not a bad idea to write it like this. This is the photon. This is energy total. So we'll write that too. So now we need to figure out how to write the total energy in terms of energy of a photon instead. And think about this. This is just energy, right? I think the easiest way to remember this is via food because people like to think about food. So if you have a bag of potato chips and each one has 10 calories in it and it has 10 potato chips in it, what's your total number of calories? Well, 10 calories, 10 potato chips, that's 100 calories. So you just multiplied them together. This isn't any different. It's still energy. It's still numbers of things. And so to take our you know, potato chip or sometimes cookie example and put this in terms of that, well, we took the number. And in this case, we're going to be using photons instead of potato chips. And we multiplied it by the energy of one photon. or before in our analogy of potato chip. And that got us the total energy. So that's sort of the equation for it. But this isn't an equation I'd give you an exam. You don't want to memorize this equation. Just think about how it works. The number of something times that energy is the number of photon, or, or is the total energy. So now we can rearrange a bit and actually treat this mathematically. We want the energy of a photon so that we can use E equals HC over lambda. So we're going to need to take the total energy, divide by the number of photons. So we have our 2.5 joules. Now the question becomes, can I just put in 8.56 times 10 to the negative fourth moles? And will that give me the correct answer? Well, no. This is moles, right? And I said number of photons. So we need to convert this into number of photons. So we do that with Avogadro's number, just like we've kind of always converted between moles and the number of whatever. And as always, you can take that out and do it as a separate equation or just fill it all into one. And when you do this, you get that. And I held out a lot of sig figs. That's fine. Just underline the last significant one. And now we can fill that into E equals HC over lambda. Because now we have the energy joules for each photon. You'll notice I a lot of times use photon as a unit. And that's not a unit you have to put there, but it's a good thing to get in the habit of just because that makes sure you know that this is a joule per photon and not a joule per mole and not a total joule. So even though it's not really an actual unit, it's like saying I have five eggs, right? Eggs isn't really a unit here, but it's descriptive. Same thing here. You don't have to have it to be right, but it is a good thing to put down. So now we can fill in T equals HC over lambda to solve for lambda. So rearranging that. And filling in all of our constants and our E. And we've plugged that into our calculator to get our answer, making sure to round our final answer as appropriate. 
since we only had two sig figs, we need to round to two sig figs. And we get that as our answer. So that's how we go through and do these problems where we have a certain number of moles, a certain number of atoms, um, and, and convert in between everything. And as always, I can ask this to you in the backwards direction as well. But this will, this sort of equation, quote unquote, will help you out there. Just don't memorize this and don't expect me to give it to you on an exam because that's something that you should be able to sort of think through logically and decide on. And the food example always kind of works well for that. So now moving on a bit, now we have sort of the, all the, the mathematical backdrop in order to talk about some really interesting things. So the next kind of large portion of this, this talk, and maybe even next time, is going to be discussing <coughs> um, emission spectra. So here we have a three different series written out, and these are not something that I expect you to memorize. As with um, all things in this, this sort of classification where you have to memorize what people invented and what people did. I would prefer you just to make sure if I talk about Lyman series, Ballman series, Passion series five years from now I see you walking around campus and I ask you that, you should at least be able to tell me that hey that has something, that's, that's the emission series that has to do with transitions. I don't necessarily care if you memorize which part of the spectrum they're in or exactly which one they come down to. But if I say something like it's in the Balmer series, a transition in the Balmer series has a final energy of n equals two, you should be able to use that Balmer series shouldn't throw you off. So what these are, these are a set of transitions and each one was discovered by the person it's named after. And you can see these different light spectra, these different transitions, and you can actually see this using different um, spectroscopes. And we'll look at why this is really useful in a minute. So these are three of the series in the hydrogen atom. So you can actually, this is some of the visible region for hydrogen. And you can see these, and they look like this. Now, if you've ever done um, flame tests, we'll talk about those in more detail in a minute, but this is what you're actually seeing when you do flame tests. So if this is the emission spectrum, this means that this is when you look at a hydrogen out in you know wherever, and you excite the hydrogen electrons, and they fall back down, this is what you're gonna see. Which means if it's emitting these select things, it's absorbing all of these. They're always going to be opposite. So if I were to ever draw you an absorption spectrum, you could draw me the emission spectrum just by drawing where there's missing lines. And of course, this is just the full spectra so that you can see that. Now, this is just for the visible region, which is a pretty small part. Um, so this is also drawn out for all the rest of the regions. What these are talking about is these series that I talked about on this slide. So not all of these are in the visible range. They all fall into different ranges. So here you see the Lyman and the Balmer and the Passion, and then three of the other ones as well. So those were just select parts of it that people looked at and said, hey, I can see this whole grouping of lines and I can go through and I can calculate where these all came from. And same thing here and same thing here. Now, of course, with these, you would need some sort of spectrometer to show you exactly what the line spectra are because you can't see them. These you can just see, you can buy like a $2 piece of diffraction grating and look at something burning and you can see it really well. The rest of these you're gonna need some sort of um, spectrometer for. So what is this useful for? So one of the places that it's useful for, and, and simple to do too, I mean you can do this kind of three seconds in a lab, is emission spectra to identify certain elements. So you need to, anytime you wanna to try to do this sort of emission spectra and you wanna look at it, you have to excite the electrons first. They're not gonna just magically excite themselves and fall back down. You need to do the excitement and then let them fall. So in this case, you can just do it with a flame. You can go ahead and you can burn something and the, the heat from the flame will go through and excite the electrons and then they'll fall back down and then you can get these colors. And so what you can do is you can just take an element, put it in a little bit of water just to kind of you know, mix it up, 
put it on a loop, stick it in a flame, and it'll grow, glow these bright colors. Now, it's, and this isn't really an exaggeration at all. Sometimes, you know, pictures on the internet are exaggerated or done under exact perfect conditions. They really glow this bright. And it's, it's fast, easy, you can do it a bunch of times. Um, I don't think that you guys actually do this in the lab, but you can see videos and things of it online. Um, and it's really cool um, and, and really simple. Now, there's obviously some difficulty in identifying elements if they're mixed. If you have both barium and potassium in there, maybe it's gonna be a little bit hard to see what's going on. And so you would again need to get some sort of diffraction grading or spectrometer to tell you exactly what's coming off. If there's only one element, if you're in a lab setting and someone says, here's an unknown, figure out what it is, this works really well. Now, someplace else that it's used a lot, that in, and you can kind of hear about in the news and stuff sometimes, is for astronomy applications. So it would be really nice if we wanted to know what you know, a particular star was made out of, if we could just kind of you know, race over there, grab a little collection flask and come home and analyze it. But that's not exactly something we can do. So one of the ways that we can do it is we can look at the light that's coming in and we can see what it looks like. So I just threw up hydrogen here, but let's say you're looking at some sort of, of um, supernova star or anything else. And you go through and you look at it with through a diffraction grating. This is a really cheap one that you can make at home. And you see this, mostly this. Maybe there's some other lines in there, but they're faint. You would know that that's mostly made out of hydrogen. If you looked at it and it had an emission spectrum that was mostly helium with just a little bit of other things, you could say, okay, well, that's mostly made out of helium. And so these emission spectra allow astronomers to go through and look at pretty much exactly what an area is, is made up of. The, and again, if you have overlapping sections, it gets a little tough, but they have really good equipment to do this and they can you know, sort through the mess and figure out exactly what all is there. Now, let's do a little bit of you know, going back to when we were a little kid and we're gonna answer some questions. So we're gonna answer, why is the grass green? Why is the sky blue? And we'll probably also do, why is the sun yellow? So why is the grass green? So if you had, you know, depending on exactly how your parents wanted to answer this and how much time they had on their hands, they may have just said, yeah, it's because and waved you off because you're five and you don't care that much. They may have told you it's chlorophyll, which is, you know, not wrong, but let's go a little more in detail. So this is chlorophyll. So the idea behind chlorophyll, and you know, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, is that it takes in one color light and reflects the other. So it's gonna absorb red light and reflect green light. So your eyes are gonna see the reflected light. So this is a graph of this, so that you can actually see the absorption spectra. So absorption and emission spectra are something that come up a lot in analytical chemistry. Um, not, and I don't necessarily just mean the class analytical chemistry, I mean in actual applications of it. Lots and lots and lots of people do different types of, of absorption and emission spectroscopy. So here's an example of a graph of the absorption spectroscopy of a couple of different chlorophylls. So this chlorophyll absorbs right here and right here. So you can see this huge absorption peak in the red region. So it's taking in all of that red light. <coughs> now, we've been talking about just absorption spectra of one atom, hydrogen mostly, or different you know, atoms. This is a big molecule that'll do it, and that's no different. It absorbs it by, by a complex system that I'll let your biology teachers uh, or biochem teachers go through, but that's where this happens. So you can see this absorption peak here, and the same thing for chlorophyll. A. You get this big absorption peak here. So what happens if you shine green light on plants? And what happens if you shine red lights on plants? It's always good to kind of look at this and see what's going on. So you may or may not know that this, this absorption of light is what allows it to go through and convert the um, CO2 into oxygen and gives it its energy. So if you shine green light on a plant, let's look at what's happening in the green part of the emission spectra, or absorption spectra. Nothing, right? There's no absorption here. So if we shine green light on a plant, it's probably gonna die. It can't, it can't photosynthesize that. Now, what if you shine red light on a plant? Well, in that case, 
it's not really going to see any difference. It can absorb just as much red light as it can white light, because that's pretty much where the whole absorption is. And so because of that, if you shine red light on a plant, it'll do just fine. Now, why is the sky blue? So if we're standing in, in for that matter, why is it sometimes blue and sometimes not so blue and sometimes red, right? It's not always blue. So to look at this, we need to think about what's coming down from the sun. So what's really coming down from the sun is white light. If we were to walk out into space, we would just see white light. Now, what happens then is if we're directly underneath the sun, we really would mostly be seeing just white light. But both directly under to some extent, and even more as you go out along the outsides, what happens is, is that the red and the orange light, those can kind of go straight through. But blue light, that has real short wavelengths. So your blues and your purples and things like that, real short wavelengths, and those are gonna scatter around. Now, let's go back to our laser experiment just a second and say, well, how did we see the laser? What does our eyes see? Our eyes are always going to see scattered light. That's the only thing we see. If it doesn't scatter, we don't see it because we need those photons to hit our eyes. So with the laser, we scattered it by making little you know, water droplets, kind of making a little miniature atmosphere for it, and then it's scattered. Same thing is gonna happen here, but all light doesn't scatter equally. So something like blue and purple and that region and green, that region of the electromagnetic spectrum, they have very short wavelengths. And so those are gonna get scattered around a lot. And when those short wavelengths get scattered, that's what we see. So all of the blue scattering we see as our sky turning blue. Now, you may have noticed though, if you go outside and you look at your blue sky, and you look right around the regions of the horizon, it's not really blue anymore, it's mostly white. What happens at this point is that so much of this gets scattered. Now we have to think all the way back to like three lectures ago when we talked about scattered light and we talked about constructive and destructive interference. Now we're going a long ways back. If that happens, now everything's being scattered around and it's being completely destructively interfered out. So that becomes white because all the blue has scattered and canceled each other out. It's kind of like you know dropping pebbles in a pond. Well, if you drop so many of them that you can't actually even see an interference pattern anymore, it's just kind of all becomes a wash. So interference on the, on the horizon is gonna scatter that out. But up here, it's gonna scatter enough that you can see it, but not so much that it scatters each other out. And now we have one more question to answer. Why is the sky yellow or orange? Or excuse me. Why is the sun yellow or orange? So looking at this and thinking about it, first of all, is the sun actually yellow or orange? It's a good question to ask yourself. And it's not. If you fly up into space and you look at the sun, it's not yellow or orange. If you look at the pictures sent back from the astronauts and the space stations and things like that, it's not yellow or orange, it's white. So why do we see it as yellow or orange? Well, what's happening here? All of our blues and our greens and our purples are being scattered away. So the only thing that comes down from the sun then, what originally was white light, the blue, purple, green, that's all scattered into the sky, into the atmosphere. And what we actually see directly coming down from the sun is what, less, what is left over. So if our blue, greens, and purples are gone, that leaves us with our red and yellows and oranges. And so that's what we see directly coming down from the sun because that's the only part that we can look up at the sun and that our atmosphere doesn't scatter away. Okay, I want to bring this one back again. We've talked about black body radiation at the very beginning of quantum, and I think it's good to talk about it one more time now that we know a little bit more about what's going on and how you can kind of see this a little bit better. So this kind of goes into the, the sun's temperature issue as well too. So keep in mind, when I said that the sun was white or yellow, we not only know that because we have pictures of it, but when we take the spectra of it, Remember our sun falls into this 6,000 category temperature and it falls into this region where we see all of these colors. So we have our purples, our greens, our yellows, our blues, or our oranges and reds. These parts, that part of the spectrum is a part of the spectrum that gets scattered in the sky. This part of the spectrum is a part that can make it through our atmosphere relatively unperturbed. Now, with that being said, if the sun's way at the horizon, 
now even the red and orange and yellow have time to scatter. And so that's where we get our sunsets from. Okay, so now our sort of um, last run through interesting um, life and research slides is what I, I, I want to show you this and without having to, you're not going to be tested on this a huge amount, but it's important to know that there's a lot of transitions here that we haven't discussed and we haven't talked about, but that people use all the time in research. So we've talked a lot about going ahead and setting something, sending something up, letting it fall back down. Um, but there's some other types of transitions that can be used too. So this is actually from one of the places that does, um, they make microscopy for fluorescence microscopy. And this shows you all the different ways that you can actually have transitions happen. So you can have just what we've been talking about so far, which is these sort of transitions from one state to another up, or absorptions. You can have these sorts that we've been talking about down, which are emissions. And don't worry too much about this um, singlet and triplet state. You, that, you don't need to worry about that. There's also this whole other state, though, that we haven't really talked about much at all, and we're not going to. But if you go over here, now a whole other sort of emission happens. So mostly what we've really been talking about when it comes down to it is fluorescence. The idea that you emit or that you excite something and it falls back down. And we haven't talked about time scales very much because it happens almost instantly. If you excite something in, in that sort of fashion, it comes back down very, very quickly. And that's how fluorescence works. You can think of this as sort of you know, a black light. You turn a black light on something that's black light, black light active, it glows. You turn the black light off, it doesn't glow anymore. Um, and we'll talk about these in just a minute. Now, this section, when you have something that comes down here and then down, that's called something else that we actually, depending on um, how many little brothers and sisters you have, you might still have in your daily life. So things that fall into this category are phosphorescence. So what is phosphorescent? These are things that glow in the dark. So the fluorescent things that we kind of can see with our eye out and about are things like black light active paint, um, things of that sort. This sort of transition talks about phosphorescence and that's slow, that's delayed. Things that are glow in the dark fall into the phosphorescent. Now let's talk a little bit more about what's going on in these pictures. So this is, these animals have a gene encoded into them that makes this protein. And what this protein does is it's, a green, it's called green fluorescent protein. And this shows up in the research a lot, both um, in biological and chemical, because the chemists really like to mutate it and do different things to it and make it useful for a bunch of different applications. The biologists really like to use it. And so I think it's worth talking about here while we're talking about fluorescence. So this was pulled from, this was a gene that was isolated from jellyfish that um, they, they noticed kind of glowed. So the way that this works is the same way that we've been talking about. It can take in light and then emit it back. Now, the way that this works in these animals is that you can take and you can genetically engineer animals, and this doesn't hurt the animals at all. They're perfectly fine. Um, the worst part about it is you have to put them under UV light for a little while to make them glow, and that obviously doesn't hurt them too badly. So you take this and you say, well, I want to look at the skin cells. I want to see what's happening to a certain protein that's in the skin cells of mice. And so you genetically engineer the mice to, to express this on a very particular gene, and you can see it. If you just kind of quickly throw in Google, you know, GFP animals, you'll see little mice with it just around their ears. They, they just wanted to track one protein in their ears. Or in this case, they have lots of different fluorescent proteins. One to track a protein in the nucleus. One to, to it looks like some sort of microtubule or something like that. So that they could track three different things. And they could take pictures of them because they were all different colors. So originally this was green, as shown by green fluorescent protein. Now they've done some little mutations here and there, and they've changed it so that you can get the whole spectrum of colors. And so, you know, these are just have slightly mutated names. Okay, done, done with that sort of thing. Now, since I know you were all missing our talk on the Schrodinger equation, let's talk a little bit about that. So we have this H psi equals E psi coming back. Now, remember, this is just the exact same slide as before. So uh, remember that our psi here is our wave function, right? 
And we just said that that describes the movement of a particle. And we said that this big long um, operator that I showed you, if we combine these together, we, that's how we found our energy levels. And we talked about how psi squared is a probability density. The place, the way of describing where you can find an electron, the likelihood of finding an electron in a certain place. Now, we kind of mentioned this and then I didn't talk about it too much. So now we get to talk about it a lot more. These probabilities densities make up the atomic orbitals, which describes where the electrons are. So now we're gonna start moving into talking about the atomic orbitals. So now we can kind of move on and talk about many electron systems too. And we're just basically gonna say, hey, some people who know a lot about this have figured out ways of approximating this to a really good level. And now we can do this for multi-electron systems. So we're gonna be focusing on this section now for a little while. So atomic orbitals. So you may recognize this as S's and P's and D's. Um, so if we have each of these, we know that these are the exact solution to the Schrodinger equation. So what these actually are, and I'll scroll over here a minute so that you can see it, is these are if you take the probability density, the psi square, and you use a computer to actually graph out the probability density to 95%. So there are approximate solutions, and the reason I say that is that this kind of goes back to the idea that you can't actually solve it exactly, that there's problems that come up. So what they do is they take, and they take the way that they did it for the one electron system, and then they put a bunch of little additional terms on it that help make it better. And so they're approximate solutions, not exactly. We're not gonna go into that, that's peak immaterial. So this shows you that where you have a high probability of finding the electron. It's about, they usually draw it to the 95th percentile, just because technically it goes out infinitely. It's just that it's not something we'd wanna draw or 90% probability, sorry. Okay, so these are what they look like. You may or may not have seen these before, where we have S orbitals and we have P orbitals that sort of look like this double balloon shape, and then the D orbitals, which sort of look like the four balloon shape, um, plus this odd one. So this is if you take the wave functions, you square them so you get the probability density, and then you graph them. Now, up until now, I haven't shown you what these wave functions look like, I'm gonna show them to you, but you don't really have to do anything with them. But it's worthwhile to know that these equations do exist and that I haven't been making them up. So this is all of them listed out from your book. And we haven't talked about quantum numbers yet, which we will in a very brief moment. But if you look at this, this is the wave function for the 1s. So if you take this and you graph it, you get a shape that kind of, or you square it and then you graph it. You get a shape that kind of looks like that. So for the 2s, the same idea, it's just slightly different. The one, that should say 2p, sorry, 2p, and so on and so forth. So that's in your book, and you don't need to worry about memorizing these, but for your info, that's where these actually come from. And so we're just going to be using what they look like and filling in and doing electron configurations and everything like that, just knowing in our heads that this is what they look like. So I think for today we will end there. And then next class we're gonna start in on quantum numbers. We'll spend some time on quantum numbers and then also moving into electron configurations and energy level diagrams and things of that sort. <laughs>